nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, um, so first of all, thank you for coming today. Uh, welcome to all the new people here today uh, who, who I know, but I'm glad to see you again for this semester. Um, and for those of you who are returning, also I welcome you back. Um, so basically, uh, last time, uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, we basically did a kind of a very quick overview, like 30,000 foot view of like, what is fiber optic communications? Like, why does it matter? And basically the argument of the first lecture was it's a, a global network. And in fact, uh, you have fibers in everywhere nowadays, like essentially every continent uh, where people live, except for Antarctica, perhaps. Um, <laughs> and uh, so basically, this is the backbone of the internet. And uh, in order to, hey, welcome. So in order to understand what's happening with fiber optics, then we need to understand uh, the basic component, which is the fiber. Right. And so we kind of started off a little bit of detail on what are the different fiber modes and what's the difference between the single mode fiber and multi-mode fiber. So now I'm going to kind of continue along those lines first for the kind of the first one third of the lecture today. And then I'll talk about a few other topics that are kind of like bigger picture uh, that are impacted by uh, the fibers. Right. So basically, like, how do you construct a whole system for telecommunications in a little more detail? And then how do you actually modulate the actual communication across the fiber? And then how do you potentially send multiple signals down a single fiber at the same time? And the illustration in the back is supposed to kind of give you a hint about how you could do things like multiplexing. I'm sure you guys will figure it out. You're all smart. <laughs> so, First of all, Maxwell's equations. You guys have all seen Maxwell's equations before, so I don't have to tell you what they are. But the reason I'm showing you Maxwell's equations is just to refresh your memory and also familiarize you uh, with the notation uh, that we're uh, using. Okay, so of course this is a nice uh, set of uh, uh, equations in the following sense. Like obviously, first of all, while uh, if you look at each individual equation, you think that it predicts like electrostatic behavior or like Ampere circuital law, like you know the generation of magnetic fields from currents. But if you look at it carefully, Faraday's law and then also Maxwell's correction to Ampere's law is also embedded, and so that actually allows for electromagnetic waves. And so, of course, in this class, we're mainly concerned about the wave equation that's predicted by Maxwell's equation, right? And it's basically coming from uh, E fields generating B fields and then B fields generating E fields, right? So it's basically like a virtuous circle, like going back and forth uh, to propagate uh, optical waves. And as you know, um, there was a long discussion uh, back in the day about, you know, first of all, you know, like how quickly are these moving? And of course, it's well known that they're moving at the speed of light in vacuum. Um, and then that also gave rise to the question once it was discovered that this was at the speed of light, which was like, what is the medium uh, for propagation in vacuum? So that gave rise to the concepts like the ether. But as it turns out, that's not necessary to have any sort of ether. Uh, there's no absolute reference frame and that's what general relativity uh, in special relativity address. Okay, so in any case, so the key wave equation that we get uh, from combining basically pairs Maxwell's equations, and I've written this as U, where U can be either E or H field, uh, basically it looks like this. And so you could either think of it just as like Cartesian 1D equation, uh, where basically you have a second derivative in space, and then a second derivative in time, and then they're basically proportional except for uh, this one over B squared term, okay? And so then that means that actually you have uh, wave propagation, uh, which is described by this sort of equation where you have basically a position term and then you also have a harmonic time dependence, right? So I see most of you have already seen this, right? So this shouldn't be uh, surprising. But stop me if you haven't. 
So then uh, if we specialize to the case where we're in cylindrical coordinates, then of course the equation looks a little bit different than Cartesian, uh, naturally. Um, so this is something that's also covered in like some of the undergrad classes here at Purdue. And so you may know that, of course, the, the derivative in uh, row actually has two terms, right? So you both have a second derivative in row as well as the first derivative that looks like this. But you also have a derivative in the uh, azimuthal component in cylindrical coordinates, which is phi. And then, of course, the z component just looks like the Cartesian case. In order to solve this equation, we can do separation of variables. Um, and then this separation of variables basically says that our overall E field has like a row dependence, has a phi dependence, and a z dependence. And these can all be decoupled from one another. So they're just, it's basically the overall E field is just a product of each of these functions. Okay, so if you make that assumption, then you can actually simplify the equations up here to this set of three equations. Okay, well, maybe it doesn't look simplified, but it is actually <laughs> simplified in the following sense. So now you see that basically there's uh, a z-dependent component. So this is basically propagation down the axis of the fiber or other cylinder. Um, and then it basically has this propagation constant beta. And so this beta is gonna show up over and over again in this class. This basically like our propagation constant in z direction. Right? And this is closely related to the effective index, which we'll, we alluded to last time. And then second, we have this azimuthal equation where capital uh, phi basically represents the, uh, the azimuthal dependence. And the key thing is here we have like this m value. And m is basically an angular momentum type uh, e expression. And so basically if m equals zero, that means as you go around, there's no change in the field, uh, but if m equals one, m equals two, then you have like more and more momentum. So when we're numbering uh, modes, oftentimes uh, the angular momentum index or m is, is one of the key parameters. And then of course the second parameter is going to be essentially what's happening in the road direction. And so the way to think about what's happening in the road direction is we basically have like an effective frequency squared here and then we subtract beta squared, and we subtract m squared over rho squared, okay? And so whatever is left, this is basically uh, the, uh, I guess you could say the k vector or the momentum in the uh, radial direction of the cylinder, okay? And so then this, this is also a very key uh, parameter because this is what determines the, uh, the spatial extent of our mode and basically like how many uh, nodes or anti-nodes it has as you go from the center to the uh, edge of the core to the cladding region, okay? And of course, this equation has been known for a long time. It's already been solved, so you don't have to solve it by hand. But as you may know, uh, like the solutions are vessel functions. And vessel functions are function of rho, um, and then these uh, uh, exponentials here as a function of the azimuthal quantum number, m phi, and as a function of the, uh, the product of the uh, momentum along the z direction and the z coordinate, so e to the i beta z, right? And so basically the last two dependencies are very simple to understand. The, the, uh, I think the Bessel function is probably the least obvious or least trivial, okay? So the key thing here though is that the uh, the expressions that go into P are related to kind of the uh, residual momentum. And typically we take like uh, something like a P squared is equal to N1 squared times K naught squared minus beta squared. So N1 being like kind of the core refractive index and then beta uh, being just the, uh, the momentum along the Z direction, right? And so basically if uh, P is relatively large. Typically, that means that we can have like a lot of modes in that cavity. If P is small, then we have very few modes. And then this actually gives rise to what we call the V number, V is a vector last time. And we can actually say that there's a cutoff uh, for each uh, mode, which we mentioned last time. And basically, uh, we always have like at least uh, two degenerate modes in uh, like a circularly symmetric uh, fiber. 
um, which are basically like the lowest order modes, which, with, which is basically the same mode with two different polarizations. But then we also have these higher order modes that kick in when this V number, which is shown here, is greater than 2.405 uh, or so. Okay. And that's determined by the number of Bessel functions that can fit inside of that cavity um, in the uh, radial direction. Okay. And then this expression here, uh, this n bar is basically telling us what is the uh, effective refractive index of some of these modes um, in the presence of like a core and cladding region. And it's basically telling us that it's kind of a linear superposition of the the cladding region plus like a little bit of the core region. And then the degree to which it overlaps is determined by this uh, so-called V delta parameter. Okay, so that's just giving you a sense uh, and basically, like, you can see that as you get to larger and larger uh, V numbers, then typically what happens is uh, for, well, I should say for V less than one, of course, then you actually have uh, increase in V, but then like for relatively large B, uh, B, you can ignore this first term. And then basically a larger uh, V gives rise to a smaller V. Um, so then that means that you get closer to um, the N2 uh, value for the effective index of the medium. Um, so now uh, in terms of losses, uh, so as you know, uh, for transatlantic cables, there's a tremendous amount of loss possible. Um, and so basically what I've tried to do here is just capture first the linear loss, which I think most of you know, it's like Beer's Law. So that's basically just saying that the output power is exponentially attenuated with this absorption constant uh, alpha. And of course, this is all wavelength specific. That's why I showed you last time. And then we said that for most fibers, uh, the lowest values of alpha are at 1.3 or uh, around 1.55 microns. Okay, so that's why we typically use those two bounds. Uh, but there are additional losses that I wanted to at least make you aware of. Not that we have to solve this in detail. Uh, so what I was going to say is that um, there are actually a few different nonlinear loss mechanisms, right? And so I'm not going to expect everybody to memorize these uh, mechanisms. But basically what this is showing is that uh, there are basically, uh, in addition to kind of like these linear loss mechanisms that you see here, where you basically get this exponential solution, there are also these uh, terms that you could think of as kind of like, you know, uh, uh, quadratic loss dependence in terms of intensity. And so these basically are known as uh, simulated Berlin scattering and simulated Raman scattering. Okay, so what is happening physically in these types of processes is that uh, the presence of uh, one beam is actually interfering with the uh, the propagation of another beam by basically causing additional Raman scattering, which pushes your uh, light that's incident at a given wavelength into a different wavelength and possibly gets scattered out of the system entirely and then therefore lost. Okay, and so basically what, what you can see is in both of these equations, like they're very similar in form, uh, but what they're showing is that there's like a Brulein uh, scattering term G sub B, and then there's a, a Raman scattering term G sub R. And then basically uh, both of these uh, terms contribute in very similar ways. So in general, you can actually combine those two. And so in addition to these two loss mechanisms, uh, there are also uh, some uh, challenges in terms of uh, change in the phase of uh, propagation of your system. And so the way to look at this uh, change in phase is that there are actually two contributions. There's the so-called self-phase modulation, and then there's a the cross-phase modulation term. Okay. And so the self-phase modulation uh, is basically something that changes the, uh, the propagation down the length of the fiber uh, by a certain amount. Um, and so you can see here, it's basically proportional to power. So basically, if power goes to zero, you know, then the propagation constant beta prime is just beta. But um, as you get to large powers, like even if gamma is small, 
then you do actually have a shift in the effective uh, uh, propagation index. And the way to think about this physically is that the presence of a relatively uh, intense beam uh, causes uh, Kerr nonlinearities. And the Kerr nonlinearities typically raise the uh, refractive index, and the increase in refractive index increases the effective propagation constant along the axis, right? So that's really the way to think about it. In cross-phase modulation, a very similar type of thing is happening, but it's happening from a different beam rather than the same beam, hence the difference between self-phase and cross-phase, right? So cross-phase is just another mode that's causing the same kind of thing to happen. And so in general, you could just add these two terms, like basically a gamma P self and then a gamma prime P cross or something, right? But then uh, a more general way to look at these kind of problems is just combine both of those gammas into a single gamma. And then you see your overall envelope has an amplitude A, so then A squared is like your power. And then you can actually write like the whole propagation equation in this form. This is like typically called like a beam propagation method type uh, formulation. Like if you just include these first three terms, including the first term on the right hand side, but then if you add this extra term, then this becomes what's called nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And so this is a way to capture both self and cross phase modulation across multiple modes. So. So in general, like you can see that the linear absorption is really easy. You kind of know in advance like exactly what wavelengths. But once you get into, you know, like multiplexing and you have uh, basically a non-zero value for these G's and for these gammas, then it can become a bit more complicated. And certainly I won't expect you to solve like really complicated problems for this, but it's more like to appreciate like, you know, the, the physics of each type of uh, nonlinearity and how that affects the performance. Another thing that's very important for determining, uh, you know, fiber's capability of communication is group velocity dispersion. And so presumably most of you are familiar with group velocity. Anybody not familiar? Okay. So the concept uh, with group velocity dispersion is just that when you calculate group velocity, Typically, that's done at a given uh, beta and omega for a given mode, right? But as you actually try to spread across like multiple frequencies, then uh, it actually becomes more complicated uh, because your group velocity refractive index actually changes uh, according to the slope of uh, the effective refractive index uh, with uh, frequency, right? So in a lot of materials, like that are, are low loss. This is not as great of a problem like compared to a highly lossy material where dn d omega would be huge. But still, uh, even in uh, something like a fiber optic cable with very low loss, dn d omega is not exactly zero. It's determined by the so-called Selmayr equation. And so uh, the Selmayr equation basically tells you uh, like how much dispersion you'll have in a low loss material if there's some absorption peak like at very short wavelengths or whatever. Um, and so then that actually translates into a difference in the time of arrival uh, for different pulses. And you can see that actually typically the, uh, the difference in time of arrival, this delta t, is proportional to the difference in omega times this uh, so-called beta 2 factor which captures the group velocity dispersion. I mean, typically we define D as the dispersion parameter to be basically this beta to second derivative of beta with respect to omega times this set of constants, which is like two pi C over lambda squared. And the standard convention is put a minus sign in front of it. So the overall uh, units of this, you can see uh, like beta, of course, you know, has units of uh, momentum, omega is, uh, basically inverse time, um, and then you multiply by lambda squared uh, and C, and so basically the residual units are typically time over uh, space or length squared, and so it's usually written as picoseconds per kilometer nanometer, which may sound like a weird unit, but the way, way you can think about it is basically how much delay is there in time uh, 
times like the length of the fiber that you travel through times the uh, the wavelength spread between the two different signals at different wavelengths, right? So what that tells you is like uh, if if you have like a value of one, if you went through one kilometer of fiber uh, and it had two modes that were one nanometer separated, there would be one picosecond delay between them, which may not sound too bad, but of course, once you go to like a thousand kilometers, now it's gone from one picosecond to one nanosecond, and that really starts impacting communication. Now, of course, I mentioned the Selmayr equation. It's up there uh, as the first uh, equation. Um, and that's just telling you like what dispersion would look like uh, in general, right? So that's just a general uh, dispersion equation, um, which shows that like you have basically in a dielectric material like a glass, uh, typically like these uh, like loss, loss mechanisms, uh, which don't really strongly impact the absorption. Like we said, the alpha absorption is pretty low, but it does certainly, uh, impact the dispersion and group velocity dispersion as a result. And then, a uh, typical approximation for dispersion is that for every material, you have like this so-called lambda ZD value, and then you can actually, uh, express dispersion in the units that I mentioned previously as 122 times one minus this ratio of lambdas. So just to give you an idea of like what are some normal values uh, for lambda ZD, um, it kind of depends on what uh, fiber you're talking about. They're not all the same, of course, as you can probably imagine. But uh, you can buy basically uh, two types of fibers typically, like those for around 1300 nanometers. And so that's basically the first four here. And then the last four are closer to like 1500 uh, plus nanometers. And of course, like I said, those are the two lo low loss regions. And this showing you that uh, there are some dispersion uh, values that are above one, uh, because before I mentioned one is probably a okay number unless you have really long distance. But uh, some are as high as maybe 20. And so of course 20 becomes more problematic over long haul. Uh, distances, but typically not too bad for just a few kilometers. Um, and then you can also see that there are actually some specific uh, uh, designs and things you can buy, like from Lucent, for example, uh, where they actually specifically uh, try hard to have like low values of D um, at the target wavelength range. So that's kind of interesting. So any questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Well, so the way to think about the effective cross-sectional area is that this is like, you know, the spatial extent of the, uh, the mode that's supported in that fiber. Um, and typically it's mostly in the core, like you said, but it may have some spatial extent in the cladding. So it's like rather than trying to say, uh, the core and cladding diameters directly, it's trying to like kind of look at it slightly differently to say like how much spreading is it going to have spatially. Um, I don't know like in this context if it's like incredibly important like it's not as you can see it's the effective area is not really correlated with dispersion directly um, but you know of course I mean there can be a little bit of interaction between those two parameters. Okay so then uh, this brings me to this issue about uh, communication right. So Basically, the, the most fundamental equation you should remember, uh, and you don't have to remember all of them, but basically the, the most important one is basically this B delta T should be less than one. And so what does this mean? So basically the way to think about it is if you have like a certain bit rate, your bit rate uh, should be low enough uh, so that um, you don't send more than one bit uh, over a time period where you can have like uh, time spreading in the arrival of uh, signals, right? So another way to look at it is just that you don't want to uh, send uh, a bunch of bits of information and then have uh, them arrive out of order, right? So this basically B delta T less than one is a way to ensure that every bit arrives in the same order that you sent it. So that's really the concept. It's very simple in that sense. Okay. But the point is, like, once you define, like, this very simple B delta T less than one, 
then there are actually uh, several things you can do. Uh, so there are actually a couple of different expressions for delta t uh, that you can use either in terms of the wavelength spread. And so that was what I was talking about a minute ago where I said delta t, like the time spread is basically going to be the, uh, the dispersion parameter times the wavelength spread times the length, right? And so that's L, LD delta lambda, right? So LD delta lambda is equal to delta t. So that product with B has to also be less than one, right? So hopefully that makes sense so far. And then the other thing is that uh, delta lambda could also be defined potentially in terms of uh, standard deviation if you have uh, kind of a Gaussian spread of wavelengths, okay? And so typically we would define uh, this delta and lambda would be, uh, you know, basically like uh, four times uh, the uh, the, uh, the standard deviation, right? And you may be familiar with the concept that 95% uh, of a Gaussian distribution is within plus or minus two standard deviations, right? So that's basically where that comes from, uh, this third expression. So it's just saying that... Um, you know, sometimes we may not actually have an explicit value for delta and lambda. And strictly speaking, in a Gaussian, as you know, it has infinite bandwidth, theoretically. But, but it's kind of absurd to assume delta and lambda is infinity, right? It doesn't give you a correct answer. Um, so what we're saying is that, like, practically speaking, if we just say delta and lambda is like, you know, 95% of the power, then that's like a very, very good approximation. And this is this just showing you that you can also potentially uh, include additional uh, nonlinear terms that cause additional uh, spreading of the beam. So if you're concerned about things like uh, the stimulated Berlin scattering that I mentioned earlier, then these can actually be incorporated into this equation explicitly. Okay. So, yeah. So now, any questions before you move on to the next part? Yes. Uh huh. Is that an actual? Is it supposed to be B two? Oh, so the beta three is basically like a a nonlinear. Uh, so basically, the way to think about it is like before we had a beta two, uh, that was like the second derivative of. Uh, let's go back here. So basically, it's the second derivative of beta with respect to omega, and so we defined like a third derivative of beta with respect to omega. And then that actually tells you uh, kind of like this higher order uh, dispersion that's associated with the presence of nonlinearity. And so uh, sometimes that's also written as like this uh, S, S parameter here, okay? So then this S parameter basically uh, is capturing like the, the impact of nonlinearity on the, the beam spreading. So, so I think the way to think about this is just that um, like, if we have high power beams in, in our system, then we're likely to have uh, more dispersion than we would otherwise. So then we need to basically give ourselves some uh, margin. And then this is a way to basically incorporate the correct amount of margin. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Okay, so now the next part. So I want to explain how we can design this whole system. Okay, so first, look at the top part. Um, so basically, uh, you know, we want to take some input and then send it somewhere else, right? And that'll be our output, right? So, so conceptually, you get that part. <laughs> you know, you want to type a text message into your iPhone, and then you want the, your friend to get it, right? So that's, that's easy. But then the question is, how does that happen, right? And so basically, the, the easiest way to think about it is you have to have an optical transmitter which is basically your source, and then you have a channel, and then you have a receiver to basically translate that optical signal into some sort of electrical output, right? Um, so within that uh, overall system, then we can actually break it down into a few subsystems for each part, okay? So for the optical transmitter, typically we can break it down into four parts, right? So basically first there's a driver, okay, and this driver is basically pushing this optical source, like, so, so you could think of it as, like, you know, just some control electronics to drive the 
optical source, like just get it going, right? But in terms of sending any information, you actually have to modulate that optical source. And typically it's modulated by an electrical input, right? So that electrical input that I mentioned here is actually entering at this plane of the modulator. And then after the signal is modulated, it's not enough to modulate it because now you actually have to couple it into the channel, right? So that's also a very key step, as you can imagine, uh, to kind of get it to go where you want it to go, right? And of course, there could be, in some cases, many channels, and so you have to know which one to put into. Now on the, uh, I'm going to skip the channel part now because we kind of talked about that with the fiber. But now on the receiver side, then of course there are a few steps. So basically you have to now do the opposite of what you did with the transmitter, which is basically couple it out of the channel back into your system, um, which is the receiver system. And then the signal has to go into a photo detector. Okay. And so then, uh, this was a little hard to illustrate, uh, clearly, but basically what, what this is trying to say is that actually the photo detector is doing, uh, potentially two things. Like, so you can read out the photo detector directly with electronics. You can also, uh, push, uh, the signal from the photo detector into a demodulator. And so then this, uh, combination of the electrical signal and the demodulator measurement, uh, will basically tell you what uh, actual uh, data was coming through that channel, right? So that's really the, the concept of what I'm showing there. I know it's fairly abstract at this point, but basically any like uh, optical receiver system has to have like all these components as far as I know. I mean, I know there's been some discussion about doing everything in optics, but I think for now at least I haven't seen that. So <laughs> uh, you kind of need that. Now to make it maybe a little more concrete, um, here's another uh, picture to look at it. And so what this is basically trying to show you is, uh, you know, the source is coming from here, the signal is coming from here, and then basically you have like this initial modulation happening, like this electro-optic modulator, and then this is a channel coupler here, pushing it into the fiber, and then you may have optical amplifier within the fiber, and then it propagates until it couples back into a different system, which is a receiver, has optoelectronic uh, demodulator and a photodetector, and then that's read out as a signal, like electrical signal, right? And so that's really a more physical view of the system. But I think like conceptually, like this illustrates actually very clearly exactly what's needed logically to make this work. So those are two different uh, perspectives on this uh, system. And now uh, in terms of actually what physical hardware do you need for doing this, uh, it actually really depends on the wavelength, as you can probably guess. Um, and actually, I think the earliest systems were operating close to 900 nanometers. And so oftentimes they would use silicon photo detectors and they would use uh, mainly gas as the source and for amplification. Okay, and then of course propagating through the fiber. Okay, so um, why, why don't we use this anymore? I mean, it seems like a good system, right? Any reason we don't use that very much? We, do we forget how to make silicon photo detectors? No, of course, yeah, we didn't forget that, but what's the, the main reason we don't want to use uh, like 900 nanometers? at this point for optical telecommunication. What's that? Yeah, well, so that that's definitely a concern. You can have two-photon absorption, but I think more broadly, we have a lot of loss mechanisms like Raleigh scattering um, and potentially uh, abs like silica absorption and so on. And so that combined uh, set of absorption is certainly okay for short haul but if you're talking about like a global network, it's just too much loss. And so in order to really expand the network, it was necessary to actually shift to this set of components. And of course, this set of components, you can see you can't use silicon anymore. Silicon has uh, you know, too high of a band gap energy, but you can now use germanium instead, which is another group four element as a detector. Um, you can use actually, instead of Algas, you can use indium gallium arsenic uh, phosphide as basically your laser source. 
And you can also do something interesting, which is use rare earths as a, a amplifier. So that allows you to not only reduce the loss, but now you can extend the range even further by taking in a signal and then doing a, a so-called erbium dough fiber amplifier, where the signal is basically being repeated without like loss of the signal intensity. Uh, because basically the erbium atoms are being electrically pumped and then are just re-emitting when they're stimulated by the presence of your uh, light signal. And then, of course, it's modulated in the same way. You don't lose that analog information in the system. And, of course, uh, we're still using glass, uh, but now it's a lower loss region of the glass. Uh, but I did want to mention that there's this special uh, dispersion compensating fiber uh, or dispersion shifting fiber uh, that I had mentioned earlier. So this also is another way to actually increase the bandwidth of the system without uh, losing too much, right? Uh, the only potential downside really is maybe it's like slightly, uh, you know, more expensive or something. But I mean, it's basically going to uh, give you so much more capacity per bit, uh, per bit per second or something, then it's probably cheaper. Okay. So, uh, any questions about like kind of the components that go into this? All clear? Okay. Cool. So now the next part, I'm going to talk about how you can modulate, uh, the signal. And there are a few different methods to do that. Okay. So basically we're coding the information into the waves, right? Um, and so basically I'll try to cover uh, four basic modulation techniques. Now, of course, later in the class, we'll go through all this in more detail, but this is just to give you an overview of what you can do, right? So in field modulation, um, you may be familiar with uh, like microwave modulation or n maybe not, or like radio frequency modulation. Um, so, I mean, it sounds good because it's like you can either modify the amplitude like AM radio, or you can mod modify the frequency a little bit like FM radio, right? So it's like, why don't we just do FM radio in optical spectrum, right? <laughs> the problem is that uh, most lasers don't like that. Um, it's not that it's impossible, but if you want a laser that can do that, um, it's like usually super expensive. Uh, it has to be extremely stable, extremely coherent, and it has to have good polarization control. Um, and so that alone, uh, raises the costs like orders of magnitude. Um, so in fact, although it sounds like in principle a very appealing approach, in practice, like almost nobody uses field modulation. So <laughs> I just wanted to mention that it may seem like non-obvious, like why don't we use AM or FM radio for optics, but we don't do that. Um, now, uh, the thing you can do though that's somewhat related is uh, do an intensity modulation. And so the difference between intensity and amplitude modulation is you're not actually uh, directly modifying uh, the amplitude in the same way as AM radio, but you're directly affecting the, the uh, intensity instead. Okay, so that means that like you're not trying to control the sign uh, of the amplitude, just the magnitude of the amplitude, right? So it's a little bit less control. Uh, but the good thing about that is it's much, much easier to do intensity modulation than amplitude modulation. Even though I know it sounds like maybe almost a distinction without a difference, but it is, it is like reducing slightly the amount of in information you can encode into the system if you just do intensity modulation. Uh, but it certainly, uh, has very high frequency. So that means you can still encode a lot of information overall. So it's still say you get, can get a lot more information into a light wave with intensity modulation than a radio wave with amplitude modulation per unit time, per channel. Okay. So that's, that would be like the key takeaway there. Um, and you can see, of course, this is just an example where you have some hypothetical modulator. It takes some carrier signal and then you're basically boosting or, or suppressing the intensity over time, right? Typically suppressing is a lot easier, of course. Now, that's not the only way you can encode information, of course, although I think it's conceptually easiest. Another approach is actually to do what's called pulse code modulation. And so in pulse code, the idea is actually that you 
have like a series of pulses and these pulses will actually capture um, like uh, digital information in the system. And this is an example from cell phones, like using PCM. Okay, and so this is basically saying that if you want to encode a certain amount of information, uh, like say, uh, I think in this case it was like uh, eight bits of information at a time, then basically uh, you you would pulse uh, the signal, basically you have the amplitude be non-zero, certain amount of times and each of these uh, times basically uh, corresponds to a one. So you can convey a certain amount of information in each uh, time window. And so I think the reason to do that actually is that there's potentially some uh, error correction or redundancy built into this, right? If you just try to send one bit at a time and there's zero error correction, if anything goes wrong, if there's any like loss in the signal temporarily or uh, potentially uh, your receiver goes down for a very short period of time, like say like you know a few nanoseconds or something, then there's really no way to recover from that. But if you uh, basically take uh, eight bits, but then uh, one bit is like basically uh, a cyclic redundancy check bit or something, uh, then basically you can confirm that the, the signal received is uh, consistent with the error correction method that you're using. So this is basically a way to just get like more accurate digital information across the channel. So that's really the concept of PCM. And then of course, uh, there's also what's called on-off keying. Um, and so in on-off keying, the concept is somewhat related to what we talked about previously, like a kind of maybe uh, think about this as, you know, the digital version of the intensity modulation, where instead of just trying to gradually vary the intensity and then uh, convey an analog signal, here we basically just say we're only going to have like two intensities, zero or one. And then we're basically going to uh, turn the modulator on or off and allow signals to go through or don't allow them to go through. Uh, but then there's like a couple of variations on this as well. And so basically in uh, what's called phase shift keying, the idea is like we would basically try to shift the frequency slightly up or down. In the phase shift keying, we would actually take the same signal, but then we would shift the phase, basically have a phase shift as you go uh, between zero and one. And, and the phase itself would convey important information about uh, the information you're trying to convey. Sorry, I know that's on Okay, so any questions about that? All pretty clear. Yeah, and of course, we'll go through this in more detail later on how, how the modulation works. But that just gives you a general sense of like what you need to do both in terms of encoding the information, and then obviously that directly dictates how you decode it. So now this brings me to the topic of multiplexing. So of course, if you look at this picture, what this picture is showing you is a lot of different colors. And of course, as you know, every color corresponds to different frequencies. So that means we, we can potentially take all those different colors and then put them maybe into a single fiber. And then that might be one way to send more than a few bits of information at a time. Okay. And uh, in fact, you may have like multiple levels of multiplexing in these systems. Okay. So then of course, the first one that I think probably most people in electrical engineering would know about already would be essentially electronic multiplexing. So you may be aggregating information from multiple sources electrically, like in a computer or something. Um, and then you may be like take using that to create packets. Uh, for your system and then sending out those packets. But then in optical multiplexing, the concept is slightly different. Um, logically, it's very similar, but here you basically would take signals from multiple channels and then you're basically trying to do one of two things. You're trying to either uh, split them uh, across time, uh, so time division multiplexing across frequency or across like a coding mechanism, like CDM. Okay, so just to kind of explain what the, each of those are. So basically in the frequency division multiplexing, we just say that we have a number of channels, and then each of these channels is at different frequency, okay? And so 
these channels ideally have some sort of buffer between them. So then there's minimal so-called crosstalk or interference between adjacent channels. Okay. Um, in time division multiplexing, uh, it's slightly different. So rather than trying to use multiple frequencies at once, we're trying to have multiple frames. And then we can actually send different frames at different times. And we can alternate between sending different frames uh, from different sources. Like say if we had three uh, people that were all trying to communicate down a single fiber, you know, first I let uh, uh, Betsy go, and then I let G go, then I let Hamabadi, right? And then and then we do do another round of that, and so we basically let everybody have have their turn, right? In the CDM method, the it's slightly different, in which we basically would uh, take each channel and then encode it in a different way. So then hopefully these uh, different codes will not interfere or have crosstalk with one another. And of course, there are a lot of different concepts about how to do that. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of those right now. But let me just oops, sorry, show you in this, a simple example. Um, so let's say that uh, we have a signal, which is like 1101. OK? So now, basically, what we do is for each of these uh, bits, whether it's a 0 or 1, we basically give it an address code. And the idea is that if we have multiple users, each of the address codes are non-overlapping or non-interfering with everybody else's address codes. The way this address code looks, maybe you can accommodate like three different address codes within this time interval, right? And so each of these address codes, if you're sending a one, then you have like uh, on-off keying at all these different times. And then uh, if you have, uh, of course, a zero, then you basically don't send anything. Right. Um, so the idea is now you can actually send uh, multiple people signals simultaneously because they all have their own address codes. Uh, now, of course, that means that uh, the receiver also needs to know uh, who who owns each address code, and then how do we like map that back into like a, a you know different set of channels and signals, right? So so this is obviously a bit non-trivial to deal with this, but it is possible. And the advantage of that is, uh, since it allows basically more or less simultaneous communication, uh, it has very low latency compared to some of the other methods, like uh, the time division multiplexing. Now, of course, uh, you may not just be doing one type of multiplexing. You may be doing multiple levels. Um, and so the key thing here is that oftentimes you may have, like, uh, this is just an example, like basically a bunch of like really low, uh, low bandwidth, uh, individual connections, like say individual people's computers. And then they may be multiplexed into a uh, so-called T1 line, which is kind of like a very, uh, low end, uh, fiber optic. But then these could actually be multiplexed into like four, uh, uh, multiplexed, uh, signals, which go into a T2. And then you have six go into a T3, and then seven T3s go into a T4, right? So it's like you kind of like build up to higher and higher capacities, like as you go further down. And of course, like, you know, if you're doing long haul communication, you really want to be at this upper end because building out a huge long channel that only has like four kilobits per second doesn't really make any sense. So <laughs> if you're going to make a, a really long distance uh, channel or link, uh, then it should really be at the very high end if possible. Um, and so wavelength division multiplexing, which I mentioned previously. Um, so you understand, of course, these are different frequencies and crosstalk is a challenge. Uh, but you also need to have multiplexers, kind of analogous to what I was showing you earlier, that can basically take uh, lecture optical signals from each of these individual inputs at different wavelengths and then combine them into basically, uh, you know, a single, uh, fiber. And now, of course, since you're operating with multiple wavelengths, that means it has to be a multi-mode fiber typically. Um, and then what this is showing is just like, you know, if you are operating, say, at 1550 nanometers, and since we talk about it so often, I'll just tell you now, it's called the C-band. 
then uh, it's typical. Now, this is not like set in stone, but it's typical that you could fit pretty easily about 40 uh, different uh, channels, okay, within this window for this E band. And uh, basically, what this requires is that each of these channels has about a 100 gigahertz spacing. But when you send the light, then of course, you don't want it to have a full 100 gigahertz uh, bandwidth, but you want its uh, standard deviation to be uh, less than 25 gigahertz. So there's like less than 5% uh, overlap from channel to channel. So you don't have too much crosstalk. And of course, like, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into this, such as the length of the channel, the amount of dispersion, um, and uh, the uh, the type of encoding that will impact uh, how much, uh, how many channels you can fit and how closely you can fit them. And of course, your hardware itself will determine, you know, what what specific uh, wavelengths can you access successfully and how closely can you space them or, or control them. Right. But in general, you're just trying to minimize the crosstalk in these kind of method, but squeeze as much light as possible. Right. And those two goals are intention. So you have to find like the right balance between those. But that, of course, is good engineering problem. So um, I think we're running short on time. So I just want to maybe explain one more thing. I might go, go through the last couple of slides later. But I just wanted to mention for now that uh, uh, the typical spacing, I mentioned 100 gigahertz, but it could be as small as 25 gigahertz. And your uh, light source itself needs to be extremely stable for this to work well, as you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> because if its uh, wavelength is shifting around, then uh, your channels are going to have a huge amount of crosstalk. So, um, and there are things you can do in terms of adding and dropping signals, uh, which I'll talk about next time. So I'll let you go now. Thank you for coming.